example, I want to thank the organizer for providing me this opportunity to share with you some of our new results we have uh, since uh, 2011. So my talk will be following the theme of Dr. Ruby uh, mentioned uh, protein and peptides can, is a really expanding area of uh, potential therapeutics. And what I'm going to give a specific example of a new hormone as a potential uh, protein therapeutics. And here's my talk is related to a new hormone called arisen. Uh, here's uh, what my lab does. So we do a uh, protein uh, receptor ligand interaction. Uh, the basic science, we use a variety of techniques, biochemistry, structural biology, cellular assays, animal model of disease, and the ligand engineering comp computer aided. And to address problems related to diabetes, obesity, and inflammation. And between those two, basic research and the clinical science, we have bridged them to do some translational discovery type of research, such as novel receptor or novel ligand discovery or protein engineering. And the example I want to give to you is we have worked for, uh, since its discovery of uh, this uh, new hormone called arisen. And arisen, this is a new hormone. It's an exercise-induced hormone. It was discovered about two years ago by Bruce Spiegelman's lab at the Harvard Medical School and Dana Harbor Research Institute. And, uh, um, and since then, we work on those. And this is a, uh, a hormone. Uh, it's once you have an endurance exercise, for example, uh, you have uh, you have a training for like a couple of hours each day for like two months, you will see the effect of the arisen level in the plasma will going up as much as twice. And this is made by muscle, and then through it, the entire mechanism, how it was generated, still unknown, but it, it's linked to a one of the master metabolic regulator, PGC1-alpha, and generate a, a, a precursor, arisen precursor called PG, uh, PN, uh, PNDC5, fibronectin like the main uh, containing protein 5. And this is a membrane. Through an unknown mechanism about cleave, this membrane protein release its uh, functional part, arisen, and release to the bloodstream and it goes to its target. Its target is Y fat cells, so far known. And, uh, uh, it, the, it, its main function now known is turn white fat into brown fat, therefore burns excess of uh, uh, energy. So obviously it's very uh, closely related to the, some related to the obesity problem we are now increasingly facing as an epidemic. Uh, just give you a few words about the fat. There are two different types of fat, brown adipocytes and white fat. And uh, it's generally thought of brown fat as a good fat, white fat as bad fat, because related to disease. And they have very different features. For example, brown fat, it's thermogenic, it generates heat, has a lot of mitochondria in the cell, and it's also multilocular. And has certain, a lot, a number of brown fat genes, such as UCP1, uncoupled protein 1 which generate, uh, 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 burns the energy. In, in contrast, brown, uh, white fat, or uh, white adipocyte, has very different features. It's non-thermogenic, it's unit locker, which means it's only one lipid drop. You'll see another better feature. It's very few mitochondria, it's very less developed, and it's not, there is very little of brown gene present. This is just to give you a cellular view of the brown fat versus white fat, uh, their uh, sites. So this is the, on the left, that's the white adipocyte. You have a single uh, big uh, lipid droplet. In contrast, brown fat, you have a lots of a multiple uh, lipid droplet. And one of the main thing difference here is the mitochondria, if you can compare it with them, in the brown fat, there is lots of mitochondria. So it's very well developed. And because of the uh, mitochondria contains iron, and it gives the, uh, the cell the brown color. Okay, so you see the white versus brown. And there is some uh, other feature, for example, brown gene, you have a UCP1 present, CDR, which is involving lipid deposition, and PGC1 alpha, master regulator of metabolism, show, all showing up highly in brown fat.
Okay, so those are the uh, different features of those two different kinds of adipocytes. <coughs> RSN, once it, after its discovery, has been proposed to fight obesity, so it's a novel hormone. Uh, one of the interesting things it addresses is this excess of white adipose tissue they have a closely linked clinically to the obesity and type 2 diabetes. This is a comparison of uh, a body of a skin of a 250-pound person versus a 120-pound normal uh, individual. You'll see a lot of fats, and this person on the left is much likely to get uh, uh, type 2 diabetes or related obesity problem. And this is showing, again, showing you the potential, the, the, uh, the function of arsen generated from the heat by exercise and then secrete arsen into the bloodstream, turn on the uh, gene, uh, browning gene, UCP1, CDR, PGC1 alpha, then turn white fat to brown fat. Therefore, it burns all the energies. Where are the arsen expressed? Uh, the systematic research has been done, and mainly if you look at those, of course it's expressed in muscle, that's known because generally in muscle, also it pre present highly in heart, heart muscle. So the significance of that is still unknown, and there is a lot of other places essentially none. So a lot still, you know, in terms of the linking between those messenger RNA expression level versus the relate to the physiological function is still largely unknown. Uh, here's the main physiological function we know, turning white fat to brown fat. It's ex exercise induced. So this is an example of uh, mice and uh, in human. So you have a control mice and exercise like for three weeks. For, in the mouse model, you see the level of uh, RSN messenger RNA level going up about twice in serum, in plasma. And also same for human. But human needs longer exercise in, need, instead of three weeks, need two months. Okay, eight weeks. And you also see this, uh, uh, this hormone protects against uh, high fat induced obesity or di type 2 diabetes. This is showing glucose tolerance test, showing arsen, which is a lower level. Uh, you see that it brings the glucose level down instead of a comparison, it's just a GFP. And uh, another feature of this is the, it, it's a po it is a potent inducer of a brown gene. So this is just a ma uh, showing some of the uh, standard, uh, you know, the characteristic of brown genes: UCP1, CD, and the PGC1 alpha. They are all enhanced compared to control, dramatically increases, and also compared to another known uh, browning uh, hormone called BMP7, which is uh, this. Uh, uh, this red is arsen, uh, FNDC5, it's much stronger. So these are all known, and uh, uh, we made, see so here's the sequence of the, this uh, hormone. So it's, uh, it's relatively small, only 111 residues, okay, a little larger than insulin. And we made a protein, and we use a mass spec to verify the protein using the sequencing. So those underlined in blue, those are all verified fragments, which is showing the protein we made is a crack one. And this is the purification of the protein we use in recombinantly, actually using the E. coli. Interestingly, when we purify protein, it's showing as a dimeric by size. This is, we, we do have a little, we have a monomeric form of RSA mutant as a comparison, but for now, you take my words for that, the retention time will be here. But normally, we purify white type is a dimer, and that is the significance of that. And this is a purified protein. And we study the activity of this recombinant uh, hormone, and this is uh, using two different adipocyte uh, cells, and we test those of the related uh, browning genes, UCP1, CD, uh, and PGC1 alpha. You will see in the one of the cells, the arsen sensitive adipocyte line, you see significant increase of uh, those browning genes, and the optimal um, the concentration of the action is around 100 nanomolar. This is using primary adipocyte isolated from mice. You see also you have a several. Uh, time fold of increase in terms of messenger level of those browning genes. So the interesting of the when we purify this protein, this is a dimer. So in terms of a protein or peptide itself, it's still relatively un, didn't know much in the field. So 
so what we're trying to do is why this is as a dimer. So fundamentally, we're trying to characterize the physical and the chemistry, physical chemical property of this peptide. And what we're trying to see why it's a dimer. So we're using, for example, the sequence of uh, arsenic has a one single cysteine there. So we were wondering whether it's, a, it's because of a disulfide bridge forming. We did use an add DTT or beta cap ethanol. It's showing the shift, the retention time does not change, which suggests it's not disulfide bond induced. We also add, we also question whether this is a, a electrostatic interaction forming the monomeric became dimer with a very high concentration of sodium chloride, the retention time also did not change. Okay? And you compare to the red, those are monomeric mutant protein. And all the other, all those treatment is the exactly the same as the retention time as white type. So these are not disulfide bond induced. They are not hydro, uh, electrostatic interaction induced. So what's, the, what's left? Hydrophobic interaction, we think. Okay, so at that time when we start working on that, there is no crystal structure yet. So what we did using compute, computer aided the method to generate the model of this protein. There is a homologous protein, about 40% sequence identity. Uh, the protein, uh, the fibronectin type three domain is available at, by that time. And we use this as a template to generate the models using different programs, just using Modera, and uh, give a similar uh, fold and we use this as uh, initial structure information to aid our design of the protein. As you can see, using different models, they generate basically very similar uh, structure, except the, some of the flexor loops or the ends. So what we did, because the protein is relatively small, we actually, uh, the idea here is to scan the whole surface of this protein, the hydrophobic residues, change those to alanine. So this is a kind of alanine scanning of the whole molecule. Because of the protein's relatively small size, we, can, we were able to do that. We generate all the mutants we made, or it's about, uh, about two dozen, and we, we check whether they are still, whether they, you know, uh, some residue uh, causing the protein for a part into monomer. Yeah, so you will see this is a retention time. You see this Y type as a dimeric molecular weight, and you see some of the uh, mutants, they are, became a monomeric. And we do have uh, analytical ultracentric fugation to verify if some of the mutants they are, became a monomeric protein. And we also mapped out the, uh, in one of the uh, area of the protein is causing dimerization, and those are specified, showing in cyan, those are the protein does not affect dimeric state, showing in yellow and Red, those are the uh, residue, hydrophobic residue. If you mutate to that to alanine, the protein became monomeric. So we, so we basically we generate some of the monomeric uh, arsen. And uh, uh, two years later, there is a, 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 a group from Duke. I actually solved the crystal structure of this. It's a dimeric, which is consistent what we observe, and this is showing the structure showing in green, showing the, the structure of arsenic, which is very similar to our predicted model, except some of the loops. And this is just showing one of the monomeric, uh, one of the uh, uh, monomeric uh, proteomer. So it, it is in the crystal shape, it's a dimer. So this is using, we are, uh, because you using the concept of, called the hot spot, initially proposed by Jim West's uh, theory, hot spot, we, because our protein bind to each other, in this case is a homodimer, homo, uh, homodimer, and we can, because of their hydrophobic interaction, we can mutate those and to create, you know, the different variants. And this is the uh, hydro, uh, in, uh, dimer interface mapped by our systematic scanning. This is the, observe the crystal structure, you have a dimer interface. Uh, one of the uh, difference here, you, you will see mainly they are the same location in general, but there is a, you know, two residue, we didn't get those because those are hydro, uh, electrostatic interaction, uh, glu uh, uh, glutamic acid and arginine, because we didn't do the um, uh, sc uh, scanning. So of course, so, but main thing is uh, still all those hydrophobic residues. So from the, our method, is consistently with the experimental uh, methods by X-ray crystallography. Mm -hmm. 
We also use the molecular uh, uh, dynamic simulation to study this insulin arisen dimer interface using one of the mutant. And as you can see, this is the uh, distance between the, there are two tryptophan residue in the dimer interface, one from each monomer, and they are spatially close. And if we mutate to alanine, and because we are just to see whether dynamically the distance between those two will change. And yes, they do. We measure the distance between two C alpha, which is uh, the main chain. So if, if the dimer stays as a dimer, the distance should not change. But in case if it's, they are falling apart, the distance will change. So you look at this, this is the Y type. You may have a three little piece there. This is a, the mutant. You'll see in the mutant, uh, in, the, in the case of a mutant W62, you see significant distance, uh, uh, significant, uh, you know, uh, higher difference between those C alpha, suggesting it's more flexible and weaker dimer interface interaction. So whether our engineered monomeric arisen is, uh, uh, is uh, active or not, we, we, try, we, we try all of those mutants in also in our functional assays, we see one, uh, at least uh, several of those uh, actually have a higher uh, activity. So this is just list one of the mutant. Uh, the gray bars are for Y type, set as 100%, and the, or the uh, magenta bar are one of the mutants. So you'll see this is a significantly high increase, if, for example, for stevia, it is increasing uh, eight times. Uh, in, you know, in summary, we already have, we, for the time being, I can uh, only talk to you here because of the time, but uh, we have a lot of other uh, re uh, results, but for, for the, inform uh, the information here I want to convey is we do using without, for example, for a new hormone like arsen, even you don't know the structure, you, you can using computer-aided structure modeling, for example, to generate a model and use that information to do experimental work. In our case, we can identify dimer interface and we can identify, we can engineer monomeric arrays because in the protein therapy, a lot of time, uh, uh, monomeric dimeric state, those are important. There is a lot of unanswered questions because this is a relatively new protein. For example, the mechanism of arsenic action is still unknown. What, what is its uh, potential is this, that there's a receptor on the cell surface, on the adipocyte surface. Uh, what's the signaling pathway? Why arsenic exists as a dimer? How stable is the dimer or monomeric mutants? Whether it has additional physiological functions. So those are remain to be studied. And we are actively working on some of those aspects. Uh, these are the people uh, uh, from my lab. We have a, a research faculty, Lin Wu, did most of the work. We also have uh, several PhD students work on this project. And uh, collaboration was uh, Professor David Bevan from my uh, university working on mo molecular dynamics. And we also get the, uh, uh, some of the help from uh, initial discovery, uh, Bruce Spiegelman, who initially discovered this protein and uh, got the funding sources. And thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? Maybe I can lead off with a quick question. If you take the monomer and just incubate it, will it dimerize? The, uh, so for Y type, we isolate as a, a, a dimer. Right. So for a monomeric mutant, we have not systematically done that. But the, for some of those mutant, we isolate as a monomeric, they, you, Right now, if you, it depends on time scale. So some of those are not stable. Some are more stable. And the, those stable ones, they are still as a monomeric. Any other question? Yeah. I have, in fact, uh, one question and one comment. Can, can you show your, the, the structure and the model? <clears throat> oh, did I? Is the slide you're looking for? No, with the structure. This yes, one? that one. Uh, yes, that one. In fact, this is rather typical from the modelization. You see, you the modelization here shows, uh, predict a small uh, uh, 
uh, beta uh, right. uh, sheet. And in fact, it is longer. Yes. And that one also. And this is very typical of the problem we have with the, the modelization. So maybe you can uh, work on this. <laughs> yeah, so of colleagues. course, the prediction, those are on the left, that's the prediction. On the right is actual experimental data. Exactly. And you do see the difference. So those stretches of beta strains, those are shorter. But partly is, if you look at those, it's, for example, the second beta strain is still actually long enough. This is due to the PIMO display program. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have a, a still you can make it longer, but the, uh, in certain cases it, it is shorter. So that is uh, uh, the prediction is always a prediction. In many cases they are wrong, can be, but in this case mostly they are correct. You get the general fold. Yeah. 